you want to explain the Professor Fireball thing to me before before we start or after or during? All right. Um, I give a paper at a conference uh, that that's how I met Steve. Uh, we we went to the same academic conference. Uh, called the International Conference for the Fantastic and the Arts. And every year it's in Florida in March, apart from during a pandemic. And I had given a paper on the impact of role-playing games on uh, genre fantasy and the structure narrative structures in genre fantasy. And I was explaining about the idea of the balanced party. So if you think about like the Fellowship of the Ring, and you go, oh yeah, the quest group. And you go, but the Fellowship of the Ring is not the model for quest groups that we get in fantasy. Because we have, um, there'll be a roguish thief who is usually cynical and the comic relief, and they'll be very dexterous, blah, 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 blah. And I'm going to call this character Sneaky McStab. And so academic PowerPoint Character stats in a picture come up with the name Sneaky McStab as I'm talking about the thief character that you get in fantasy quest groups. And then there's the the warrior. And the warrior, you know, he's all this heavy armor and he's there to protect everyone and hold hold back the armies while everyone else is doing things. So he's Tank the Meat Shield. And again, so the stats came up, the picture, Tank the Meat Shield. And then uh, I was talking about wizards. And of course, mages, wizards are in that Merlin Gandalf mode, but how they're modernly depicted is academics. So they're physically weaker. They, it's all about studying and learning the stuff. It's arcane, esoteric, academic. So they are professor. But the spell they always use is fireball. They always have a destructive spell, and it's usually fireball or lightning. So it was professor fireball. It came up on the, on the screen. So that's where Professor Fireball came from, the generic wizard in fantasy. Because if you think, uh, the example I always go back to is the Fellowship of the Rings, or the, uh, the Fellowship in the Lord of the Rings. And you have the four hobbits, who even though they all get swords from the Barrowites are useless, you can't count on them to do anything, and any modern narrative would not have them because they do not serve a plot function, they don't serve a role, and they don't have a utility within the group. So modern quest narratives would not have four useless characters like that. They just get excised because it's four characters that are constantly running around doing nothing. Then you have uh, Legolas, the archer, Aragorn, the flexible ranger, Gimli, the powerful dwarven warrior who's a grumpy veteran. Like we have never seen that before. Um, and uh, obviously Boromir, and then Gandalf standing in the back as the wizard. So the Balrog appears, and the wizard says, right guys, you look after the four idiots, I'll take care of this. And of course, like, in a D&D &D group, the archer would have been plinking away with arrows to distract the, the evil demon monster. The, uh, the ranger, or the two main warriors would have been running up to do defensive stuff, to engage him in melee, to attract his attention. Aragorn would have been doing some rangery stuff. All to, to uh, distract the monster so that the wizard could power up whatever devastating spell, but it's going to take them five to ten turns after everyone else. And so you have this scene in The Lord of the Rings. It's, don't worry, guys, I'll take care of this. They all run away, and he goes, my sword and a stick. Here we go. And you go, what mage in modern fantasy, when faced with that, their go-to thing is, I'm going to draw my sword and fight them hand to hand. And that's why modern fantasy is radically different from how fantasy sort of began as a genre with, with Tolkien. Because a wizard's function and role is devastating active magical effects. And that's not what Gandalf does. That's not how magic is used or presented in The Lord of the Rings. When we have quest narratives, quest narratives in modern fantasy are all about getting the thing. Let's find the magic sword. Let's get the magical object. Let's go and get this thing because that will help us defeat the evil thing. The antithesis of what Tolkien did in The Lord of the Rings because it's not about getting the evil thing to defeat Sauron. That's what Boromir wants to do and we know it's bad because 
the ring corrupts. The ring represents power. And so the Lord of the Rings is all about getting rid of this absolute power. Because no one should have that level of power. And where do you see that in modern fantasy? And how did Professor Fireball get applied to you? <laughs> Just so, because you created this? Well, so I, uh, obviously I gave him the paper, Professor Fireball. And then we were, uh, I was chatting to Philip about one of the books. And obviously I told him about this paper and this sort of thing. So like in between chats, this was this uh, whole story. Like he, he knew, he knew about it. And I found out that Philip has been referred to as Dr. Fantasy. Yeah. <laughs> and I go, hang on a sec. Why do I get AP or, you know, uh, Mr. Canavan? I have a bloody PhD in fantasy as well. You get Dr. Fantasy because you're the square jawed, devilishly handsome, <laughs> tweed jacketed professor with your soft, generic American accent, your dulcet baritone. And then it's, oh yeah, and then that AP one. Um, so he got Dr. Fantasy and he went, well, I'm just going to call you Professor Fireball. And I went, please don't. <laughs> That's a great story. That's even better than I expected. Hey, what's up, bookworms and bridge burners? We are back to talk a little more Malazan today. And my guest for Memories of Ice is probably needs no introduction if you are into Malazan, Mr. A.P. Canavan, a.k.a. A Critical Dragon. But if you are a noob and you're along with me on this ride, you don't quite know who he is. I'm going to go ahead and let him introduce himself and talk about how he has become known as like a scholar of this series. Hi, Mike. I just wanted to say thank you so much for, for inviting me on. And if you just indulge me for a sec, Oh, so this is what one of those big fancy YouTube channels looks like. There's loads of room in here. <laughs> I am, I am, I am uh, just still flying under the radar, but uh, doing better than some. Yes, yes. Um, well, it's uh, obviously you've already spoken to to Doctor Philip Chase, and uh, like Philip, I have a, a PhD. Except while his is in a proper academic subject of medieval literature, mine was actually just in in fantasy literature. He has a fancy academic degree in medievalism, whereas mine is, yeah, I have a degree in dragons. <laughs> um, I once, I, when I was studying for my PhD, when I was in grad school, you know, the, you got a student house and you're, you're meeting your housemates for the first time. And we were all sitting down and we were having dinner together. And it was like, oh, so what's your PhD in? And this guy goes, oh, well, I'm studying this thing because it's a way to cure prostate cancer. And then someone else was, oh, well, I'm doing this thing because it's about all of the, and they were going around all of their PhD projects that were about curing cancer, that were about finding, you know, more fuel efficient engines, that were about studying uh, better techniques for MRI machines. And they came to me and said, what's your PhD in? And I went, dragons. <laughs> oh, but they got some nice looks. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, because I had that academic background, I uh, began writing a lot of literary research papers about studying fantasy, the, how the, the genre works, different aspects of, of narrative in fantasy. And uh, that led to a sideline in doing editing work for fantasy and science fiction authors and getting to know some of these authors. So uh, I started a YouTube channel just back in January. Uh, because I wanted to show the different techniques that we as readers can use to get more out of out of reading. That uh, the more you practice and the more you know about these different techniques, you can actually find stuff out that the authors think that they are very cleverly hidden. Um, and just I happen to know Stephen Erickson and uh, have become friends over the years, so he regularly comes on the the channel to show that yes, I know nothing and he knows everything. Oh, everybody needs a friend like that, don't they? I All right. So, being go being friends with authors is very, very humbling because as a critic, as an editor, you know, you, you walk into these things and you go, I, I know what I'm talking about. I've studied this, la, 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 la. And then an author will sit down with you and go, yeah, but you didn't notice this thing, did you? 
yeah. I can relate. There is a, someone I would consider a friend at this point, Christopher Rocchio. He writes these Sun Eater science fiction books, and uh, we've become friends, I would, I would say. And all the time I'll be like, ah, I think I'm an educated man. I'm doing okay. And then like, we'll just be, he'll start talking about like Tolstoy and, 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 and poetry and all this stuff. I'm just like, man, I, I know nothing, Jon Snow. <laughs> you know? So yeah, I, I can definitely see where you're coming from there. Uh, as for memories of ice, uh, I, I think something that I had the confusion of is wh what I was always kind of introduced is that you were like this scholar of Malazan. There was everything that you knew, everything about it. And then you tell me you've read the series one time. And I'm like, wait a second. Really? Okay. Because I'll listen to some of your videos. I'm like, this guy knows this inside out. Are you sure he didn't like co-write this? You know, <laughs> Am I not, is, he, is he secretly Ian Esselman? You know, that's <laughs> what I'm kind of wondering this whole time. So I think that that's just fascinating how you've, you've kind of gotten known as like this know everything kind of guy about Malazan. Well, part of it is, yes, I like I'm doing a read through with, with Philip Chase at the minute. And this is officially the second time I will have read the series. And, um, for me, I mean, you have to remember, I started reading this series a long time ago. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And um, having done like advanced reading work for uh, Ericsson and Esselmont, quite often I've read the books significantly before they've come out. So the lag time is I read the book while it's being written or just after it's, they've finished writing it and we have chats about it. Um, but then it goes off to the publisher uh, all of that sort of stuff happens, by which stage they're usually on to the next book, and you know I, I might be involved in that. So when fans start a discussion about the book, I can't comment on it, because if I comment on something I know from the editing text, from the original first draft that didn't make it into the uh, commercial text, that could give the game away if that was removed. And what I find is in my read through with Philip, this is my first time reading a lot of the commercial texts, ah, the, the actual published versions. Um, and so it, it can be a little eye opening for me because I go, I'm sure I remember something else here. But um, it, it, it's an interesting one because you, you have to be kind of circumspect about it. But one thing I will say is there are Malazan fans out there. There are Malazan readers out there who know the ins and outs of this series in ways that I cannot even imagine. Like they are experts on the lore. They can tell you chapter and verse where that character first appears and they were connected to this. Um, they are astounding experts. And I am always blown away by uh, their knowledge about the series. And like, I feel like a fraud because I come in, I've read the series once and yes, you know, I do professional sort of analysis and editorial work. And so my reading experience and, and what I glean from a text may be different, but there are people out there who know this series in ways that uh, I, I don't think that some men know their wives. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I think uh, when I first started the series and people are like, oh yeah, it's really, really, you really get on like your fourth reread. I'm like, excuse me, what, my what? <laughs> yeah, so uh, I, I'm sure reading it uh, now, doing your first actual reread. In fact, when you're talking about what you do, it kind of reminds me, before I did this, I actually like uh, reviewed media and I got to go to a screening of the movie Suicide Squad. And we went and saw the screening. We're like, that was fantastic. And then the movie's coming out. Like the reviews are terrible. Like, wow, did we watch the same movie? And then we went and saw it. And it was like, it was completely different. Like, oh, okay. Well, now I get it. So yeah, I can see how that might actually have some surprises in there. Um, no, I will, I will say like, I didn't start, uh, doing a lot of this work for for Ericsson until much later on in the series. Um, so this is really just from about, I was about 15 years ago that I, I first read Malazan. So it's just, I just haven't read it in 15 years. So this has been eye-opening for that. And I'm looking forward to getting to a bunch of the books that uh, if I can ever salvage my old hard drive, I will actually have original notes on. Oh, nice. Wow, okay. Uh, and I can maybe do a comparison to some of the stuff, but I, I'd have to clear that with, uh, with Ericsson to see whether he would allow it. 
I see. All right, so let's go ahead and kick into Memories of Ice here. Like I said, I kind of do like I did with the review because it will just be all over the place if I don't try to have like some kind of organization here. So kind of like what I did in my uh, my spoiler talks where I just kind of broke it down by group. Gruntle's group, the Grey Swords, the Bridge Burners, and Talk Tool and Envy I think are kind of the main ones. But I want to kind of start with the prologue because this is the first moment where the series kind of really just threw me for a loop. And I think it's because what we talked about um, – off before we started this about how some people will kind of tell you things about it before you get started. I'm like, I wish you had told me that. Everyone told me two things. One, this is the easiest Malazan book to read because you're already into the world. It's all going to make sense to you now. First, I'm going to say I did not agree with that assessment. <laughs> Second, uh, they told me, oh, the, it's probably the best prologue in the whole – I mean, before I started reading this, like, I can't wait to get to the prologue of Memories of Ice. It's so great. It'll make you cry. And I read it, and I was like – the only thing that it would make me cry is because I was so freaking confused. <laughs> this was the first time that I have actually reread something immediately after I finished it. I finished that prologue, and I read it again because I was like, I have no idea what is going on. And I think the second time I read the prologue is when I was like, wait a second. Does this actually say like 300,000 years before? <laughs> so uh, right away, I'm like, okay, now this just has like the hugest scope. Like I, I told you also before we started, I used to think that like Stormlight Archive going like a thousand years back in its prologue was like just like so deep. And, and Erickson's like, hold my beer here and check this out. So yeah, this prologue completely, completely threw me for a loop. And I, I know I have watched your video on just this prologue and it actually kind of helps to make some things clear, but I, I wait until I'm done with the book completely before I watch those videos. But Explain to me why you think this prologue is so amazing for people who haven't watched that uh, that video well, yet. For a start, I have three different videos on this prologue, each dealing with different aspects. And that's because um, prologues are, are fascinating. And I, I'm sorry you didn't watch the videos before you uh, went on to chapter one. If you read the prologue, the videos don't give away anything about the rest of the book. I, I try to be very, very careful when I do a prologue analysis that... I talk only about the prologue, about general themes it's setting up or well, techniques and stuff that, okay. that's going on, because I don't want to spoil the reading experience. But the first thing is, it's not exactly 300,000 years, is it? Oh, what was the exact number? I, I've, I've temporarily forgot, but it's something like 296,000, blah, blah, blah. blah. Like that. What's, uh, what's yeah. a couple thousand years at this point? So, yeah. <laughs> the, and this is, this is one of the points about it that this dating is so absurdly accurate that it's actually a clue because it's the year of burned sleep or BS. <laughs> it's, it, like it, it, was, it was an in-joke about the fact that no one could be that accurate about these dates, that you're meant to read it as a wild approximation on behalf of someone who is trying to date when this event happened that the event itself is not accurately recorded. And think about the fact that it's it's described as one of the Jagat Wars against, like or sorry, what the Imas War against the, the Jagat. And you go, how many, how many Imas are there? And you go, it's a small group of Imas. And how many Jagat are they at war with? A woman and two kids. That's being classified as a war. So you look at how history has recorded this thing that is radically different from what you're seeing on the page. So I, this is going to sound like way academic and, and give me a second. That's why we essentially, have you here. Yeah. Uh, he's destabilizing the narrative. So it is a subjective narrative where you are not to trust everything. He is destabilizing your reference system. So you are to look at it as something that may thematically be true, may contain kernels of the truth, but is not necessarily a factual representation of exactly what happened. That this is a, a fable, a, a, a story that way. And that's your clue about how to read this. That this is an element of the Malazan Book of the Fallen, that Erickson has these postmodern techniques that he uses where uh, using unreliable narration, using uh, destabilizing or, or playing around with structure, with reader expectation, with uh, tropes and subverting various elements at different times. So when we look at that prologue, uh, the time frame is to signal, yes, this happened a long time ago. And the exact date, who knows? 
No one was recording it at the time. They didn't have their little Blackberry to go. And today I hunted down three jagged. <laughs> You know, the bone casters, you know, think of even if they made a little notation on a scroll, how many scrolls would that have to be? Like, what would their diary be like? It would be a giant library following them around. Kind of makes me think so, about when I was watching Vikings and people are like, oh, well, it's incredibly inaccurate. I'm like, how do you know? How do you know? That, that, that history is vaguely recorded, if at all, you know? So, yeah. And of course, like Erickson, as, as a, an archaeologist and with training in anthropology, he knows how... Our idea of what history is, this common idea of what history is, is like, that's, no, most of that's fictitious. Mm. And you, if you think, like, when did, um, when did, what is the day the Roman Empire fell? The ancient Roman Empire. What, what is the speci- specific date? Give me the time, the day, the date, the Roman Empire fell. And you go, well, it was kind of this period. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And well, we can say like maybe it started here. And you, you, history is all about uh, spans of time. It's not generally about specific dates un- until you get to very modern history. So that's that's the first thing about the prologue. The second thing is obviously like so. This is full spoilers. Like we're talking about memories of ice. We see the event of these jagged children being thrown into the rent. Mm-hmm. And this is obviously what happened to Panion, which causes the whole evil Panion to, to eventually appear, the matron being freed. We actually, at the end of the book, look at this prologue and go, this is how it all started. So when you're first reading it, you don't realize that. You don't have that contextual information. You can only retrospectively understand it. Uh, and this is why a lot of Malazan readers talk about the reread being so important. Because suddenly, events that you did not know at the time had really significant repercussions, have really significant repercussions, much like real life. We make decisions today, and in 20 years' time, we go, I really regret that decision I made. (laughs) See, I feel like that part of the prologue really paid off. With me, the whole stuff with Calor, which was cool at first, because I was like, wait, is this the same Calor that was trying to start shit in book one? And I was like, okay, and people are like, wow, I can't believe you remembered that. And I'm like, yeah, I, I remembered that. Because you're messing with my guy Khaled and Brew, and I didn't like that. But anyway, uh, yeah, Kalor uh, obviously moves up the the ranks of my shit list in this book. But in this prologue alone here, I guess what I'm kind of confused about is like I understand how these mages like they cursed him, but I was like, if he was just a mortal, how was he actually able? And this is a read and find out and have no problems telling me that I didn't understand how he actually you know re- cursed them back. I didn't understand that part. Right. So again, remember I I had said. One of the things about this is don't necessarily read it as a literal thing about what happened. So you've, you've read uh, Norse mythology. You are, you you know, some Norse mythology, some Egyptian mythology, some, some uh, Greek or Roman mythology, you know, these mythological stories. And you're aware that when someone tells you a mythological story, it is not necessarily factually what happened. So Achilles being dipped in whatever river it was, the river Styx, being held by his ankle. So he's, a, he's a, immortal and immune over his whole body apart from his Achilles heel, which, uh, ironic name. Um, <laughs> what are the chances? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that a little contrived? <laughs> but um, when, we, when we read that, are we meant to go, oh, well, this woman actually went to that river and dipped her child in that way? Or is this a metaphorical or symbolic way of telling the story about this amazing historical warrior who exists, who, who was a brilliant warrior, who seemed to be absolutely unbeatable in battle? And then uh, when they found his body, the only wound that was obvious was one where his Achilles tendon had been severed and that had led to his downfall. You know, so, which is real? And within narrative, particularly within uh, a destabilized narrative or, or one where there's an unreliable narrator and where it's been signaled to the reader that you don't necessarily trust this. Um, how Calor does it is uh, something... Now, there is an element of this which is read and find out, which I, I won't talk about, and anyone who has finished the series and spoils this point 
is not doing anyone else a favor. There, there is coming back to this particular prologue after you finish the 10th book, there are elements here that get revealed. But looking just at it from the perspective of Memories of Ice, you have an elder god meeting up with two other elder gods, like these three powerful gods, and they've shown up and Kalor is sitting on a throne, sitting on a pile of bones. The whole continent is ash. Mm. Why did Kalor turn his continent to ash? He's not a mage, he's a warrior. Hmm. Whose perspective is the story told from? I see where you're going. Okay. No, this makes a lot of sense. See, I didn't think about this like this way. No. Um, I'm already learning so, about this. <laughs> but if you look at the start of that prologue, Krull, or Cruel, is walking through a devastated continent because the fallen god had come down, had been called down by these mages, and had devastated the continent, and all of these people died. But there are survivors. Um, what does Krull's influence do? They all die. They kill each other, and he drains their power. He absorbs their power. And so we know within the Malazan world, death has power to it. Um, sacrifice has power to it. We saw in Dead House Gates how the death of a single horse with uh, Nil and Nether, how they used the sacrifice of that one horse to give the rest of the cavalry power. We know that death, life energy, has a, a huge amount of power to it. And if that continent and the, the continent next to it were devastated by this reign of a divine presence, and all of these people died, and it, people blamed Kalor. He's being linked to that par. So there's a, a mundane explanation for where he gets magical par from in order to reflect the curses. But, and we'll go one more, and I promise then we can leave the prologue, which is what, this is why I have three videos on it, Mike. No, that's fine, it's fine, that's why I have you here. Um, <laughs> When, when you think of folklore, when you think of those, those stories about you know, the, uh, the soldier walking through the forest and he meets the witch and the witch says, if you go and do this thing and then I will grant you this and you go and do this thing, all of these things. Do you question in that moment, well, where did she get her power to do this? How did she do that? You go, no, because it's a folkloric story. And if we look at that, that part of the prologue as a myth about the creation of the Imperial Warren, a myth about wh where Kalor came from or how these things happened, a myth about these elder gods. If you look at it from that point of view, you can see why they're not focused on the mechanics of how this happened. They're focused on, there were all of these events and I've just explained them. Just by dipping this child into the river, I made them immortal. I, um, doing all of this thing. I've explained the creation of the world from a dung ball with a dung beetle rolling it up to create the world. Using this story, I've told you about how Odin did this thing. All of these things contain a narrative truth, a thematic truth, something that is there to convey meaning to us, but not necessarily be a factual account of what happened. That's only one way of telling a story. I guess I didn't look at it this way just because, you know, they curse him with like unnatural long life at an old age. And I was like, well, that turned out true. So I guess I just kind of took the rest of it as gospel as well. So, yeah. yeah. But, and this is the thing. It, yes, they could have cursed him with those things and he cursed them right back. But because we don't know, and this is a, I, I know this is a point of frustration with a lot of readers you're not necessarily meant to know you're you're meant to like elsa just let it go uh, just <laughs> tell you have just, it. <laughs> but trying to always treat it as i must know every aspect of it all of this has to make logical sense you go first of all magic is complicated second of all you're dealing with mythic time thousands hundreds of thousands of years before everything else you're dealing with all of these things you're dealing with beings whose memories of events aren't great because I can't remember what I had for dinner last week and you're asking me to remember 10,000 years ago? Um, right, that's fair. <laughs> but, you know, does, does that kind of make sense that... Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Okay. 
Are we good? Okay. No, that's good. That's good. That's that's, that's what I wanted to kind of uh, know because I wasn't definitely what. Look, I mean, I've, I've the whole kind of went to the approach of okay, yeah, this is like a retelling of history, an account of history. You know, sometimes history is written by the winners, kind of thing. I, I kind of went in with that approach there, but I guess I never looked at it as far as like, hey, this is the part where legend becomes like myth, kind of thing. You know, so that's a uh, that, that 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 that's a good way to put it. All right, all right. If you good. remember the the prelude to Gardens of the Moon, this is all about taking down a book and reading through the Book of the Fallen. You know, that's, that's what we're, we're kind of experiencing. All of these little volumes are all part of one story, one book. And this is volume three in it. And that's, that's a mighty large book. Mighty, mighty large. Let's move on to uh, the groups here. Now, when I do my spoiler talks, I like to do at the halfway point and then after I finish. Because I feel like if, you just did, if I just did one after I finish – my opinion is going to be different than maybe it was at the halfway point. And I can't think of a better example than how I felt about Gruntle. And I read the first half, books one and two, within Memories of Ice. Uh, Gruntle was one of the ones where I was like, I'm not really getting much out of this group. He could have been killed by that could change them all. And I wouldn't even have cared. You know, whatever, whatever. Literally 20 pages later, that's into the Kapistan book, is where I was like, holy hell, this is now a Gruntle fan account. Because uh, that was just one of the cool, it was just so cinematic, just with the child's tunic and stuff. Just something you could really just see like being in a movie of the part where you're like standing up and cheering in the theater kind of thing. Uh, yeah, I mean, I he does so much more in this book. But like that moment to me is easily probably my favorite moment in this whole book. It was such a cool idea before we even got into the tiger and the trach and all that stuff I, I just i really really enjoyed how much my opinion of this character changed and i think that that's something i'm learning about the way that steve does characters here is uh he'll introduce new characters and um you guys have watched my conversation with with iskar recently i'm sorry i'm repeating myself here but just in case what I think I'm learning about the way that he does characters is it's almost like real life and how you meet people is he will introduce a character and be like talking to you as the reader, like you should know this person, you know, what, keep up here. Why don't you know what's going on? And you can be kind of frustrated at first and be like, I don't care. I have no emotional connection to what bad thing is happening to these people right now. And then by the end of the book, when bad things really do start happening to these people, because they usually do, uh, I, usually you're like, oh, my God, I didn't realize I care. And I say it's, it's almost like you grow to know. It's like a friend. You grow to know them. You grow to know more about them. And you, you know, empathize with them a little bit. And I think Gruntle is the perfect example of that. Another character where I was kind of like, eh, whatever, this could just be here to, to raise the body count. But again, just like you did with Duiker, it, it's a character that I didn't realize how much I really liked until much later. And it just really started in book three with Gruntle and just a great, great arc. Um, yeah, it's one of the, I think one of the issues that a lot of, particularly in this day and age, when we read fantasy, we have very fixed expectations about how a narrative should be told, what a narrative should do. And you've read a lot, like you've read widely, you've, you've read lots of different genres and you know, like Stephen King's Bachman books are not written the same way that Stephen King wrote, say, The Tommyknockers. And- Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. But if you, if you read, let's say, It, The Stand, The Tommyknockers, and then you went into reading um, uh, the misery, and you went, "Well, where's the supernatural element? Where's the monster? Where's that thing? Oh, this is this is te this is not how you write a horror book," and threw it away. You go, "But that's not what the book was doing. It's a it's a different type of story that he is telling, even though it's the same author, and you know he's using the same brain, and it's marketed as a Stephen King book." It's an excellent horror story, but it's a different type of horror. When we read fantasy, we, particularly in the modern day, have been told to expect a certain style of writing. And what Erickson does, his style of characterization that he uses, is incredibly common in other forms of literature, but is not common in fantasy. And so, what comes as a shock to a lot of fantasy readers is Erickson sneaking in this characterization for these characters. You go, I don't care about them. And just like you said, at the end, you're like, but, but I feel bad for them. Yeah. that. Yeah. That's not fair. I liked him. Yeah. And you go, but Erickson can't do characterization. You go, well, obviously he did because you're crying at losing that character. 
you you had built an emotional connection. You just didn't see him do it, mm -hmm. as opposed to an author who spends chapter upon chapter upon chapter of a single point of view with one character. So you build your familiarity that way, where you're with them constantly, and they they spend a huge amount of page length with them to make it very clear and obvious and transparent that this is the character you should be identifying with. And because you're with that narrative perspective for so long, you build a connection to them. And if you think the Dresden books are a perfect example, we love Harry, but a lot of that was built up in the early books because we were riding along with him. We we're with his perspective. Um, whereas if you think of how long it took for us to like other characters in that series, it took them appearing in multiple books and it took them uh, for, for Butcher to spend a lot of time developing them on the page for us to have that point of connection. And then when you look at what Erickson did, and you go, but that character isn't on the page very much. And yet I felt something for them. I, I, I know who they are. I, I, I know what their background is. And you go, it's different ways of generating character and developing character. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, absolutely. Because we'll talk about, I, I want to save it for when we talk about the bridge burners, but I, I get where you come from because like Trotz, Trotz was a character in the book that I didn't think that was that big a deal. And his death, I think was the one that hit me the hardest in this whole book. Trotz, a character that no one would probably say was their favorite bridge burner, you know, but yeah, I get that. I know, but think of that scene at the very beginning where Trotz is sitting overlooking the whole mountain thing. And I, I can't remember which of the bridge burners comes up behind him. And it's the you've been practicing that because Trotz knew he was coming up. So I'd taken on the pose yeah. and it's like the whole playfulness of like these soldiers who are on watch in the middle of nowhere and they're doing anything to, to keep themselves entertained. Yeah. And that gives you those little tiny moments, give you such insight because suddenly that connects to things in your own life about the dumb things you and your friends did, or you can vividly imagine it and you can imagine how how comfortable you have to be with someone to play that kind of joke. Before we move on from Gruntle's group, I just want to kind of bring up the tennis gallery because I think that this is something that needs to be talked about. And this is where I get the whole thing with when I compare, make Abercrombie comparisons. To me, guys, look, I know he didn't start it, but to me, Joe Abercrombie is the modern gold standard for the Grim Derrick category. And whenever I think of the tennis gallery, I'm like, Joe's never done anything this dark. So this is when the whole like, is this series grim dark? And I understand the arguments against me and Philip kind of went around and around about it in the best way. And, and I feel like we're both right. So I'm just going to leave it there. <laughs> I consider that a draw in, in our discussion. But this is some of the most nightmare fuel stuff I've ever heard of in my life. I don't even know how, what happened to Mr. Erickson to make him even imagine something like this. But the whole Children of the Dead Sea stuff, that is the darkest thing I have ever read in a fantasy book. And I've read some pretty messed up ones, but it's brilliant. I mean, because like when everybody was asking me, what do you think about the painting now? What do you think about the painting now? And I'm like, oh, they really haven't done anything. And, and I think it's because I wasn't considering the tennis gallery the same thing as the painting, you know? So that's kind of why I was saying that. But I'm like, yeah, yeah they create them. Of course, that makes sense why, why, why it should be like that. But that's just, just nightmare fuel is all I can think of for the tennis gallery. I'm going to say, you didn't think the Panion were a threat because you forgot about this giant army. Well, I just mean what people were saying, what do you think about the Panion so far? And I was like, oh, they just kind of haven't really even done anything. And I, yeah, I wasn't thinking about the tennis gallery as being the same thing. So yeah, that, that was my mistake. <laughs> well, uh, one of the things that I, I love about this particular storyline, if you think back to Gardens of the Moon, and when we, we meet Rist and he's coming awake and he's thinking about his, he has his memories coming back. And he, we're in that point of view, and he thinks about how he used to dominate the Imas without them knowing, using his power to control them, to focus them, to get them to do things, to fight for his amusement. And now we're in Memories of Ice, and we see the Teniscari, and you go, well, how are these cannibals being controlled? How could anyone do that? And of course, Panion is a jagged, and they are a jagged tyrant. And they're using the par that we find out about in Gardens of the Moon. We're actually oh. seeing it being played out in front of us. But, you know, Steve uh, Erickson being typical Erickson, 
doesn't you know put a big red arrow to this and say look look back at what i i wrote in oh that's blatantly obvious now that you bring it up yeah (laughs) i was like hey you troll the hunger i guess you know but yeah that makes a lot more sense (laughs) but this this is why like so many fans they talk about the reread and it's when when you're reading through a narrative and you don't know what's coming up you're always trying to figure things out. You're looking ahead. You're trying to figure out what's going to be important and what's not. And you're, you're galloping on each time to get to the next event, to, to find out how it all ends, what, what's going to happen in the end. But on a reread, all of that pressure is gone. And you go, I know roughly where it's going, even if it was like a year ago or two years ago. Yeah, I'm just going to be in the moment. I'm going to focus on what's on the page in front of me. And you have a general sense of the world. You're familiar with the world. None of the terms are estranging anymore. None of the terms are unsettling. You're, you're familiar with what a jagged is and what a jagged can do. You're familiar relatively with what Warrens are and what they can do. So when you read now, it's, it's a completely different experience because you are at home in this world. And therefore, that immersive style that was so jarring when we first read Gardens of the Moon is now like a comfortable warm bath that you just sink into and then realize that the warm bath is full of sharks and undead and things that are trying to eat you. And things that are trying to rape you as you die. I mean, it's just, just some scary stuff. It really is. And, and the last thing on Gruntle's group, where you're talking about like characters were that are kind of in the background. You didn't really think what happens to Stani obviously is like, wow. Yeah. And that is part of Gruntle's growth in the book, but also Stani Manakis. Is that like one of the most, perfect fantasy names ever created or why i was actually saying stony at first but someone corrected me stony i'm like that actually makes more sense but it sounds even better stony manakis what a great name but that it's weird because i i remembered her character being called stony yeah and and then i looked at it and went where did i get there's no e in it yeah. it's a double n it's stony that yeah. i'm an idiot and of course erickson and esselmont frequently correct me on how i mispronounce things which is always a delight but like what happens with with Stani, obviously I did a, a chat with Philip about this and I had a number of fans disagree with me when I criticized Ericsson oh, sure. for, um, for the narrative trope that is used in that section. Mm-hmm. And it was, a stru- it was a narrative structural point and it had nothing that I said he did, Ericsson does it very well, he does it with sensitivity, uh, it, I don't have a problem with it. The, uh, the passage, that whole section is from Gruntle's perspective. It's psychologically, it makes sense. But from a narrative structural point of view, he uses a female character suffering sexual assault or rape to be the call to action for a male character. Mm -hmm. And the term for that trope is fridging. And I honestly think if Erickson were to rewrite that section now, he would find a different, he would probably have the, the scene with the child be there. If he still needed that narrative event to happen, he quite possibly would have a different way for it coming about that Gruntle had already seen the child, was already rallying, was trying to get to Stani, that something else would have been the spur to action for Gruntle. But as it is, her rip is the thing that spurs him to action. And you go, and that's that's a narrative trope. It's become very overused. And you know, if someone was writing it now, they probably wouldn't do that. Yeah. Um, well, that, I'm surprised that, you didn't ask about Buke, though. Oh, uh, Buke became a bird. Cool. <laughs> I was <laughs> like, I guess that's about as happy of an ending as a character can get in the Malazan world, right? Just, just decide to live free because you know he was pretty miserable, and now he's gonna decide just to be a bird. Good for you, man. Spread your wings and fly, my friend. And it's nice to have those moments of of happiness and joy and relief. And, and that's see, why it's that's not why grand I tell dark, everybody, Michael. I'm like, all these characters are dying. You got people getting raped as they die and stuff like that. But then everybody's like, but it's not grimdark because someone became a bird and had a happy ending. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) This dog (laughs) wagged its tail one time, so it's not (laughs) grimdark. But no, that's the, I was like, okay, I guess it's a happy ending for a character because it's not like he was in a great place in his life, you know? So cool. No, and it's, if if you think like Stani, Harlow, Gruntle, Buke, they're all, why are they caravan guards? Why why do they have this job? Because clearly they, they are good warriors. Clearly they, they could be in an army. And it's because a lot of them, um, I think, have damage. That this is a, a job that they can take, that 
yeah, they can still use their skills, but it's not the pressure of the army. That We see that with Buick. We see that with Gruntle, that there's psychological damage and trauma there. And um, seeing Buick get that reward to, to leave is actually, for me at least, a very nice heartwarming moment because it is, he, he's had his time. He's paid his penance. He, he's done the hard labor. It's nice for someone to get a reward every once in a while to just to relieve the unremitting horror and stress of, say, that siege. I can agree 100%. Like I said, it's, hey, it's good, cool to feel like we're, we're checking one in the W column for a change. All right, we got to win. <laughs> uh, let's move along to the grace words here. Now, this was the uh, the part where I say why I can't read uh, Malazan when, at home around my kids. I have to read it like at my lunch break at work or something because uh, when you info dump so much at me sometimes, I start getting a little frustrated. I start snapping at my children and stuff like that. <laughs> you know, uh, there was so much going on. It was chapter seven. That was the introduction to Ikovian, I- Brucali, and all that. And the uh, the mask council and stuff. I was like, I don't even know who's talking right now. And obviously, and this is what uh, some people that have been frustrated on the Discord with this part. I'm telling you, when you get to the end, you'll look back on it and be like, okay, it makes sense now, but it's not going to when you start. I think that's the best way to approach these books completely. But yes, when it was going on, I was very frustrated. But the Kachane Chamala stuff was just so awesome to me that I didn't care. <laughs> I thought that that was just the coolest idea. A big Michael Crichton guy. So obviously, I mean, you're a boy and in your DNA, you're all about dinosaurs, right? So basically, you're going to take dinosaurs. But how do we make raptors from Jurassic Park even cooler? We give them freaking broadswords for arms. And I was just <laughs> so fascinated by this. And the fact that they're also like super intelligent too. They made like moon spawns. I'm like, this is so much more fascinating to me than everything else that was going on with the gray swords at the time. So it was so much... Uh, one of those things where I was wanting to know more about this, but I was getting a lot more of this, where it was frustrating to me at first. But over time, I started to really actually care about these. And like right when I cared about Brucolian, yeah, well, you know, he has the old Faramir Faramir death march towards Osgiliath there. And it's like, you know, it's coming, nothing you can do about it. You know, it, it, it sucks, you know, to die with honor kind of thing. But getting so many characters all at once is just, it's something I'm still adjusting to. And being like, it's going to be okay. Calm down. Just relax. It's going to make sense. It's not going to make sense at first. Just accept it. And that's something I'm still kind of learning. Just as a, you know, a traditional fantasy reader, that's something that's still very hard for me to adjust to. But I'm, I'm getting there. And I want people to understand that I get it. It's just hard for me to let go of the usual method that I use of I'm going to not move on until I understand what's going on here. It's something I'm letting go of. Okay, so <laughs> that's all. <laughs> yeah, just... Just have your Elsa moment. Anytime you get to that, just think of Elsa. Um, and you're absolutely right. The The number of, of characters that we get introduced to, and if we are always thinking, oh, I must find out who is this character, what are they, the things that they know, are they going to be important? To you're, you're putting so much stress on yourself instead of going, listen, in the first two books, there was stuff I didn't understand, but by the time I got to the end of the book, I understood all of them major points and i understood who all the major characters were why do i think that this book is going to be any different Mm -hmm. why why am i forcing myself to try and find out everything when i know by the end of the book if i just relax and read it Mm -hmm. all of the important stuff will will be relatively clear and i can always flip back and have a look at at a certain section to see if i understand more you've already been through for two books where he has done this why is it a surprise it's, that this is going to happen again? It's like Yoda says, you must unlearn what you have learned. It's hard for <laughs> me to get to that point. But, you know, you always go back to Yoda and you'll find a way. And th- this was the point I was making. is So much modern narrative, because uh, particularly in fantasy, it is a commercial genre. And there are certain things that very successful commercial authors do. And those are the most common examples we have of narrative within the genre. So if we take that as this is what is meant to be happening, then, and we're trying to apply it to something that is different, that is trying to do something different, that's where a lot of this frustration comes from. And it is perfectly perfectly normal to be frustrated, but to understand that that frustration sometimes is because we have expectations that we are imposing on the text that don't necessarily have to be there, and that we are expecting 
certain techniques to be used that aren't being used. So we're not looking at the ones that are being used. But, uh, you know, every reader, no, no one is saying you have to love this series. Mm. No one is saying that, you know, this series is absolutely flawless. No one is saying that Erickson never makes a misstep. Um, but the general techniques and stuff, they, they are well established and they're from other genres. You'll see numerous examples of them. So it's not that Erickson is being absolutely insane and no one should ever do this. It's just it's uncommon in fantasy. I think before I started the series, one of the biggest sells points for me, and I think even Mr. Erickson does it himself, it says that this series is about compassion. And through the first two books, I was like, mm, not really seeing that. I mean, I really liked Icario, uh, Icarium and, and Mappo's friendship. I was like, I, I, he healed those dogs. I was like, okay, that might be about it. But I think Ecovium was the first one where I could see, okay, this is actually a compassionate character. And I think it makes him probably the most layered character I, I've encountered in the series up to this point. Uh, just the whole being able to take everyone's grief, their pain, their misery, their sorrow away kind of thing was just a, a really neat idea. But I, I say that this is one with this character is that I wasn't sad when this character died because it felt like it was earned. You know, he went out like a pro. Now, when the uh, the eye master putting all the stuff on his grave at the end, yeah, that's when it's kind of like, you know, you're holding, you're fighting him back or whatever. Again, very cinematic, something you could see at like at the end of the movie, not a dry eye in the house kind of moment. But yeah, very, very layered character that I kind of wasn't expecting for the fact that at first I was kind of standoffish to him because I didn't know who he was and he was talking to me like I was supposed to know who this was kind of thing. And yeah, over time, he did it again. Uh, well, uh, Erickson and I did actually a long video uh, of that opening of Chapter 7 to go through the introduction of Itkovian and uh, Carnatus and Brucalian. That introduction of the Grey Swords, we, we went through that opening line by line. It's a long video. I am not expecting everyone to go watch it. Well, it's but a we long explain, chapter, so it would require a long video or several long videos. Um, but it, it sort of shows how, how Erickson creates this. But one of the techniques, and Philip, uh, Philip actually mentioned this in, in one of our chats, that both Erickson and Esselmont use, is it's not necessarily that you uh, feel bad for the character that died, but you see and experience the pain or suffering or or loss that other characters are feeling and that's what affects you it's that empathic link to others and seeing their suffering and going i feel bad for them not necessarily oh he's gone that's something we'll get to with a uh, whiskey jack i was like whiskey jack is like oh that sucks but corlatt's reaction is really what got to me there but um think of in dead house gates when um coltian is being crucified and they're not letting him die yeah. and squint goes up and fires the arrow you don't see that as a moment of compassion of squint releasing Coltin. yeah yeah, yeah I, do. I do i do yeah <laughs> you're right check, I mean, see this is why i have you guys on Mike. Of these things to blatantly point them out to me you know <laughs> <laughs> sorry it was hard for me getting past all the other bad things that happened in dead house gates i guess maybe that was it but and but even with it, it Covian, um, although uh, one of the big themes of the series is compassion, I think one of the the things that Erickson does throughout the series is show you different ways that compassion can be used, is used. Sometimes that have positive effects, and sometimes have negative effects. If you think of what it Covian does for the Imas, you look at that and go, "That is such a genuine, beautiful, wonderful moment." Like these. These beings who have thousands upon thousands of years of pain and suffering and someone who has been disconnected from their God still takes it on themselves and sacrifices themselves to do this. Mm -hmm. And you go, that is such a wonderful and powerful moment. The downside is if he'd waited about five days, it, it would have been a lot better for everyone else. I, I said that uh, in, in my review was that you couldn't just wait like a couple more days. I mean, I know it's hard telling these creatures that have suffered for this long. Hey, can you wait just a minute? Do one more thing for me. But it's like Aragorn if he had released the army of the dead before the battle of Pelennor, you know? <laughs> but let me put it to you this way. Um, if there was an army of slaves and you went, right, I'm here to free you. Oh, well, actually, it's going to be really convenient if you fight one more battle for me yeah. before I free you. So go and do that. Oh, well, actually, you know, now that we've finished that battle, there's this other thing yeah. that as soon as we get that done, you go, no, the right thing to do is to free them, even if it is 
inconvenient. But after the fact, we see that cost. Now, does Itkovian know that's what the cost is going to be before he does it? No. Does anyone know that's what the cost is going to be before he does it? No. And so looking at it after all of these soldiers have died, you go, oh, well, if only he'd waited. But he didn't know that at the time. They underestimated how many undead Kachin Chamal were there. They, they didn't know when they were sacking this, or attacking the city, it was going to go that badly. They overestimated their own capabilities and underestimated the enemy. And that led to devastating losses. That's not Ekovian's fault. This is a good transition into the bridge burner section here. And of course, I got to go with Silver Fox, that being the big thing here. And I'm not going to lie. I was like, kind of kind of a dick move on Silver Fox's behalf there where you, they're, they're, they're wanting you to release her and she doesn't. Uh, it was one of those kind of things with that, the way she talks to Pranchol, the way she treats the Mibe. It's kind of like, it's kind of unlikable right now. And I'm sure this will turn around or whatever, but you know, I'm like, hey, that's Tattersail. You know, that was one of my favorite characters from the first book kind of thing. So it's really realistic in that you have things you like about people and things you don't like about them. You know, even your bestest friends, you can kind of feel like that. So uh, very, very interesting take on Silver Fox. I think that the takes have been kind of all over the place uh, with the read along people, but about how they feel about this character. But uh, yeah, very fascinating. And it's one of those things I think actually makes that scene in Gardens of the Moon make a lot more sense now. So I was very <laughs> happy for that. That was probably the one you said you understand mostly everything at the end of it. That was the one that I felt like I really didn't understand in Garza. And now I do. Now I do. So. But and but when you think back in the night, even without rereading, you go, oh. Uh -huh. And you have to remember, like a lot of this stuff, um, Erickson signed a 10 book deal. Like he knew, uh, well, I think it was nine books at this stage, yeah. but um, he knew what a lot of the major events were. He, he'd already plotted out a lot of this stuff. So unlike a, we go, oh, this book has sold really well. Can you write more in this world? Right. This was a, no, I, I know what a lot of, this is a self-contained narrative. And because everything was known, that's why a lot of the foreshadowing and a lot of the elements connect together so seamlessly. It wasn't that he just had a thing there and went, oh, I'll invent a reason now for why that worked. Um, so that's, it's an interesting aspect of this particular narrative, but I wanted to pick up on a point you said about Silver Fox there. So Silver Fox was terrible for not releasing the Imas, but Ekovian, you know, was terrible for releasing. <laughs> damned if you do, damned if you don't. Basically, basically. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> but isn't it fascinating that when we see essentially the same act, and everyone said, oh, Ekovian should have waited. Silver Fox should have released them. You go, do you not see that you, you've come down on both these exact same things in different ways? Yeah, I'm a and hypocrite. It's, <laughs> I'm a big hypocrite, yeah. But it, it's not about being... A, Erickson poses these things to us. That's why these events occur in slightly different ways each time. And we do have that feeling of thinking about Ekovian. Oh, uh, you, you should wait because there's a big battle coming. But with, with Silver Fox, you go, no, but this you should be doing this because you're reacting against what the characters do. Mm. And it's oh, uh, for, for me, it's interesting. No, nope, that's that's more crow I get to eat in this episode. This is awesome. Uh, so let's move along to a couple well, of other things. Before we move on, do you do you think there's a, a strong Alia vibe from uh, Yeah. Yeah, oh, no, for sure. I mean, being a huge Dune guy, it was hard for me not to see a Leo Atreides uh, with the Silver Fox character. I mean, just being that young and knowing things you shouldn't know, being way more intelligent than you should know in thousands of years of history and things. Um, yeah, but um, unlike with other series, I'm not going to mention those series. We talked about it before we started, but I don't want to get that going. Uh, I feel like this was more of a tribute than a straight rip, I think. I mean, I'm... I read his foreword in Guardians of the Moon, so I know that he's a big Frank Herbert Stone fan. I mean, because, you know, all the smart people are. But uh, <laughs> I can definitely see as that being like something that influenced that idea for sure. And he kind of put like his own spin on it, like, you know, most authors will do. But yeah, it's impossible not to see that comparison, I think. Um, particularly when he specifically uses the word abomination. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, you know, that that's the thing that you go, that seals it. There's no... There's no doubt here. There's no ambiguity. Yes, it it was this homage. 
Yeah, but I think uh, Mother Goheim is is much more likable than Calor. So, <laughs> <laughs> that's and that's enough for a debate, really. <laughs> you know, but, you know I, Calor like is he misunderstood? Is uh, well, you know. Uh, well, here's the thing, and that's again where you have like the the veterans of the series that are along for the mal- the, the reread are all like Calor is a top five character for me, and I'm like, huh? How do you feel about Stalin? You know, it's just like <laughs> it's like, wow, okay, that's that's an interesting take, and I know I've got seven of these big old honking books left. A lot can change or whatever, but right now I'm like, yo, everyone knew leaving this guy alive was going to be a problem in the end. Everyone knew how he felt about what was going on, and Calder and Bruce is like, yeah, okay, cool. I guess you had a change of heart. And I'm like. You ran for this guy for thousands of years. Has he ever had a change of heart? You know, so. Uh, he it was, never it, learns. It, yeah, yeah. It, it's but, one of those things where I just like actually screamed out loud, F and Calor when it happened because I knew it was coming, you know. But I thought he had killed Corlat, who is one of my favorite characters in this book, one of my favorite new characters. And while I'm there, I'll go ahead and talk about this romance. Usually a problem I have in fantasy is insta-love. You know, I don't like that. What I think that this works for me is because when you have people on the eve of a big battle where chances are most likely you're going to die, you can see a speed up in relationship cut through all the crap and going straight to the end. You know, so I actually kind of easily slid into the relationship. I actually was quite happy with it. And I think that's why uh, his death, while it surprised me just because before I started the series, the only names I had ever heard of before was Quick Ben and Whiskey Jack. I knew those names before I even knew anything about the series. So I guess I just assumed he was here the whole time. But uh, yeah, it was Corlett's reaction to his death, and you kind of already brought this up. That's actually what affected me. Same with 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 Trots. You know, Trots looking over and smiling and dying, and they're like, "Oh my god!" You know, so that those are the kind of things that they to get me more than actual character deaths do. Yeah, and you know that I think that's unless it's a character who you you genuinely have really connected with, seeing a character die and other characters react to that, mm-hmm. that's sometimes far more powerful. And particularly if you're with a point of view and they see someone they care about die and that because you're with that point of view, that closes the psychic distance between the narrative and the reader. And so you're much closer to that emotion. So when they see someone that they care about die, you get much more of that impact. Um, And it's like with Whiskey Jack, he's, I I know that some, some Malazan fans sort of go, like, he has this unearned reputation. We don't see his reputation. You go, we know he was a general, lead, he was a fist in the army for a long time. We know he led the bridge burners for a long time. We see how close, in, in the opening of gardening, uh, Gardens of the Moon, Gardening of the Moon, in the opening <laughs> of Gardens of the Moon, we see how close and how much the bridge burners trust him. We know that must have been earned. We don't see it because it's, sort of the end of that story. We're seeing the end of the bridge burners. So Erickson doesn't tell us the story yeah. and he doesn't show us the story. We hear it from everyone else. We get this level of respect. We know that Dujek served under Whiskey Jack and the command structure was reversed, which now Dujek is Whiskey Jack's boss. And we, we see their easy familiarity. Like we see all of these things. We've been told that these things have happened. And all of it is just implied. And so when we have Whiskey Jack, this consummate commander who knows all of these soldiers, who has led these soldiers for decades, who has strategic knowledge, has has this easy camaraderie, Rick comes in and they go, what's up? And like he's sitting having a drink with Rick. And that's just one of those insane things when you think about it, that Rick generally doesn't get on with anyone. He's very aloof. And yet he feels at ease with Whiskey Jack. Corlat, who is shut off and and feels aloof and separated from life, she feels so at ease with Whiskey Jack that it leads to this attraction and love. And once you you open yourself up to that, she's overwhelmed by it. Uh, Like We never get get to see that sort of, in this book, this opportunity of the two of them going, uh, do you know that we've lived together for three years? I hate the way that you leave the toilet seat up yeah. and I hate the way that you chew your food and the romance is all dead. We, we always forget that in the first blush of a romance, quite often, hormones are running wild, passions are running wild, and it's, you are the love of my life. I can never imagine, li- oh, hello? Ooh, you're, you're nice. Um, <laughs> 
Uh, you touched on Rake for a second. I, I want to bring this up just before I forget. How does he continue just to be like the coolest guy in the galaxy? Because like Cal and Brood and Cal are all pissed off when they find out about the ruse with the scene and all that stuff. And they're like, I can't wait to tell Rake. Rake's going to be pissed. He's going to go end everybody with his big fat sword, right? And he's just like, yeah, I already know. Let's get drunk. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, got to love him for things like that. Um, and also like his entrance, his entrance to the book. Like everyone's oh, yeah, standing around. Yeah, no and big deal. No big deal. <laughs> going down. I'm a dragon. Right. What's up, guys? You're like, you flashy show off. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> when you got the final battle when he shows up on Moonspawn there at the end, just sitting up there, just flipping his hair in the wind. I'm just like, man, you love to make an entrance, don't you? Yeah. Uh, I, I, also, I almost wish that Moonspawn had gone in backwards with that. This vehicle is reversing. Beep, beep, <laughs> beep noise as it slowly crashes down. Uh, but yeah, I mean, Rake is a, a character that I think everyone just kind of gravitates towards new and old fans of whatever. But I think finally getting a little bit more with Draconis and knowing a little bit more about the sword and stuff like that. Really cool stuff that I want to know more about. And I think that the part where he's uh, where Whiskey Jack actually like stops him from from killing all those tennis scouts was a really kind of a character defining moment for Whiskey Jack for me, you know, to to, to have to go through that. And he's upset that his men saw it and things like that. And, to me, I think most traditional fantasy fans want to know all the backstory of a character, why they're so respected. And Erickson's just like, he's respected. Deal with it. You don't got to know the story. You don't got to know the reasons why. Everyone that you meet, you don't know everything about why everybody likes them. These are things that I'm learning along the way. Yeah, so and, but it, even even that scene where Whiskey Jack goes, you, you can't attack them with Dragnapur. Like, that is, that's absolutely horrendous. I'm going to do this, and he's upset. And then he realizes... It wasn't that Rake wanted to harvest their souls. It was he wanted to spare Whiskey Jack of having to kill them. Yeah. And it's those moments where we see Rake in Gardens of the Moon having a joke with Baruch, where we, we have these moments where Rake is standoffish. Rake is always viewed, almost always viewed externally. And we project a lot onto this really cool character. But it's these human moments. I think these are the reason why people actually really like Rake, that he has these these small moments that you go, there's so much more here. It's it's the iceberg mode of storytelling, a little tiny moment implying this giant iceberg of, of history and character underneath. Yeah, I think everybody's a Rake fan except Draconis. Draconis is like, yeah, he's soft. He's not killing enough souls, man. We got to get some more souls in here to help us push this wagon. You know? so, <laughs> <laughs> that was some good stuff. Um. So uh, anything else about the, the bridge burners that you want to chat about? I'm sure there's probably a lot. I, I still don't get the deck of dragons thing. Maybe it's because I never played like Magic the Gathering or anything like that. So I don't I don't know a lot about like RPG gaming and, and cards because that's what I'm looking at it as, like really high stakes levels of Magic the Gathering. But it's, yeah, the face on the table and Ganos is now the master of this and all this. I'm, I'm just rolling. Okay, you've, you've, seen, you've seen a tarot deck. Like you, yeah. you, you know what a tarot deck is, yeah. and you know that they have major arcana and then the minor cards, like one to whatever number. I, uh, not major, I, I know a little tiny bit. I but know. they have the, yeah. the sort of, <laughs> they have the face cards, and they have uh, all like the one of wands or whatever it is. And then you look at an ordinary deck of cards, and that has the numbering sequence, and it goes up to face cards. So you can see that tarot cards and an ordinary deck of playing cards are essentially exactly the same thing only one is slightly more ornately decorated. So if you wanted to say play poker and you didn't have a, a, an ordinary deck of cards handy, you had a tarot deck handy, can you still play poker? Yeah, you have four suits, you have numeric cards and you have face cards. So if you think of the deck of dragons as a tarot deck, and what are soldiers going to do when there's a deck of cards sitting around? They're going to invent games to gamble money to pass the time. So it's not people. Uh, I, th I think get really confused or, or or blow it out of all proportion or or invent all of these things. And I have no idea if my interpretation is is what Ericsson or or Esselmont intended. But I think something as simple as that. Yeah, it's a tarot deck, and they go, yeah, well, we can use it to play betting games, to entertain ourselves. That to me immediately simplifies it, and it's it's uncomplicated then. I've just um, decided that that's a thing for rereaders, and maybe I'll maybe they'll be right, maybe I'll be wrong. I don't I don't know. So. 
Um, but it's, you know, people come up with all of the, these grand theories. So like a tarot reading and they go, oh, I use this mode or I use, I have to lay them out in a circle or lay them out in a grid. And, you know, that that's what tarot readers and fortune tellers do with tarot decks. But we also see them, uh, the the bridge burners, the soldiers, they go, yeah, but we're, we're going to use them to play betting games with. But because they're also connected, because they're in a world with actual magic, where magic actually affects things with discernible effects. If you have a tarot deck that is linked to magic and you start playing games with it, there's a chance that you will accidentally do something or there will be a, a, a magical discharge or some sort of effect that way. Does, does that kind of clear it up a wee bit? Uh, I'm getting there. <laughs> I, I'm getting there. But... There is one thing I got to bring up before we move on to the last group here because people will be upset if I don't bring it up. It's no secret that Krupp's a character that's not really working for me. And I've heard <laughs> this is a very divisive character. Some people, most, most people seem to love him. A lot of people are like me, like I he's just obnoxious. Um, with me, it was like, okay, so we got this whole chapter about why Calvin and Brew is not going to use this hammer. And Krupp said something that I'm not even sure what really set him off this bad, that he actually swings this hammer. So I was like, so this guy's had the, the unlimited amount of patience for thousands of years not to swing this hammer. And this guy who's always stuffing his face with, you know, pastries is the guy that makes him swing this hammer. And then I realized, oh, okay, he came out of this completely unscathed. Yeah, I better just learn to accept this character because he's going to be here a while. So that's kind of where I'm Okay, at. right. Number one. The first time I read Gardens of the Moon, I may have emailed Steven Erickson and went, I loathe Krupp. <laughs> Maybe. That's the I, I can neither confirm nor deny that that happened. I will say, in reading Gardens of the Moon earlier on this year, Krupp completely changed in my estimation. I suddenly really appreciated him as a character. Now, I still can't stand Escrow Past. Uh, <laughs> I'm still undecided. But, yeah. But I like Krupp. Um, maybe, maybe I need another couple of rereads and I, and I like Escrow Past. I don't know. But I can understand people being irritated by Krupp. And when you understand that position, because clearly you don't like him, if you had Kaladin Brood's hammer and Krupp was standing there annoying you yet again, what would you do? Yes, you're going to try and hit him with the hammer. That's how annoying Krupp is. That someone with the patience of centuries, the patience of thousands of years, goes, I cannot take this anymore. And he lashes out at Krupp the way that a lot of readers wanted him to. Uh. Now, there, one point I'll bring up here. In Norse mythology, there is a story about Thor. Um, and he goes on a journey to meet uh, one of the giants uh, who's a sorcerer and he has to wrestle and I can't remember if it's a cat and it turns out to or the old lady and it's, it turns out to be death or uh, the world serpent and he has to drink from a horn of mead but it turns out it's linked to the ocean so there's no way he could drink all of it and the, the giant says to him you can take three swipes at my head with your hammer so Thor does this and there's no effect and when they're walking back, there are three new mountain ranges because the hammer hit the ground and that's, that's what happened. So there's a Norse story that is exactly what happens here. So number one, that's a nod towards Norse mythology that Ericsson, you know, stole. Borrowed. Homage. <laughs> stole. Depends on how you feel about that segment of the story, I guess. But... Um, uh, no, to me right now, he's the Jar Jar Binks of this story, and it's it's driving me wild. But people love him so much. I'm open to accepting <laughs> that my opinion on this will change. But, well, it, it took me for, it took me until a reread. Yeah. <laughs> but the second point I'll raise is Kaladin Brood's hammer has a chance of a waking, awakening burn. Mm -hmm. It's not guaranteed if he uses the hammer, it will definitely happen. But the more often he uses the hammer, the more likely it is to happen. And if he swung the hammer a whole load of times, it definitely would happen because he'll reduce the the chance, basically, or he would have increased chance to one. Um, and Brood basically gets so angry with Krupp that he risks accidentally waking up Burn by swinging the hammer. Um, also, did he unleash his full his full wrath? 
maybe not necessarily, maybe he pulled it a little bit at the end. We don't know. But I think in all honesty, worrying about the mechanics of this when it's just, it's a very funny scene because we all wanted to see crop get smushed. <laughs> um, I like there's a kind of like a check swing in baseball where you're just like, eh, you want to swing, <laughs> you kind of pulled back there. Yeah. At the last second. Well, let's go from talking about my, one of my least favorite characters to my favorite character in the story so far. And that's tool. I love tool so much. I think he's such an amazing character. And I think he gets even more on this one because you always heard, you know, first sword, things like that. I guess I just never really associated that with him just being like such a badass swordsman. And his stuff with uh, with Mock and, and the others in this is just so much fun. And I'm just having a good time. If it was like talk and tool or kind of like the, the uh, you know, the, the buddy comedy kind of thing that I want into this world. And then you added Envy into it, a very uh, character that I kind of, holding it to a safe distance because i mean she's super super powerful i'm not sure i quite trust her yet but her flirting with talk and things like that and him just being like completely uncomfortable with it it's just i love the dynamic of these three and then of course um what are they called i, I can't think of the the, the mock the segula segula thank you thank you so many names i'm surprised i don't forget more on the fly but um yeah such an interesting new uh race i guess or culture that's put in here uh they're basically like just kabuki ninjas or something and and you hear a mock is just like so awesome but he's like only the third best of his people and stuff i'm like damn so uh, i think the, the whole time you're getting this build up of him and tool got to fight you know just because that's just what's got to happen and then when it actually happens it actually kind of met expectations even if a uh, kalava kind of you know blocked it there at the end but still uh it was a good build i love things when we are getting some info dumps from envy how uh talk in or sorry is tool and one of the other people are kind of fighting in the background <laughs> and just like ah oh, whatever they're doing that again i'm going to tell you a story and stuff so uh very very neat ways i think to drop in some exposition and that's i i was going to say there's a difference between an info dump and exposition yeah yeah um and it, it a bold a lump of bald exposition just dropped in the text that stops everything and it, here's all of this information that's info dumping whereas i think a lot of what ericsson does yes there's exposition in a lot of these sequences but it's blended in to something that's going on to make it interesting to make it more palatable it's you know here's your broccoli that's been mashed into something else to disguise the fact that it's broccoli and you needed this mm. um so I, I wouldn't have called it an info dump, but that that's you know more a personal preference because I, I I don't mean info dump as, a, as an insult or anything, but like the stuff where with talk all of a sudden I'm like I don't know if talk's dreaming if he's having a vision if this is actually happening and wait now we're talking about like some panther shapeshifter wait now we're talking about something called trach it, it was just like what is going on right now? So that's when I kind of joked about calling it memories of info dumps and things like that. But <laughs> it's stuff it, it, again, obviously never meant as an insult, but yeah, exposition is probably a much, much better word for it. You're right. And, but it's, it's just, it's one of those things we, when we talk about books, particularly when we talk informally, we, we throw around a lot of terms uh, because we know what we mean. But when, when like say you and I are having this conversation and it's going to be watched by, you know, on your channel, a lot more people than on my channel. <laughs> um, people copy the the things that we say, or they, they, this is how you use it. Like I saw uh, Mike and AP using it this way, and that's why I'm I'm slightly particular. But you know, given my background, I'm slightly particular about using terms certain ways because info dump is exceptionally pejorative. Like it is a negative criticism of writing. That that's what it is. It it's not a label for something. It is a negative criticism. Uh, exposition is the label for the type of writing mm. but that that's my only point on this it's you can still feel that exposition is an info dump i i i'm not gain saying that it's just personally that that's why i get a wee bit twitchy about it no it's something i never thought of so i'll, I'll take that into consideration going forward for sure um but I, again everyone is entitled to their own opinion everyone's entitled to to think and feel about books and express themselves their own way but that's, you know, when you use a term like info dump, that is negative. So people go, oh, there's a big info dump in the middle of that. And that's bad writing. And that, because it's negative, instead of you go, oh, there's a, this section has a whole load of exposition. You go, well, we all know what exposition is. And it's neither good nor bad. Uh, it, it's just describing what's there. 
But I didn't mean to correct you, Mike. I, I do apologize. No, I know what you, I know what you meant. It's it's a term that I just I never really considered that way. So no, I, I can imagine hearing that as an author probably is insulting. I'm, I've never <laughs> even thought about that. Hey, I learn a lot of things doing this. This is why I like to talk to you and Philip and people that are much more intelligent than me. That way, I learn uh, these things. <laughs> this this has nothing to do with intelligence. This is very much to do with uh, training, like. I, you, you understand taxes and finance. Somewhat. Right. So I, if I filled in a whole form, you know, and send it off to you, you'd look at it and go, AP, you absolute idiot. That's in the wrong column. That's not a deductible. This is a deductible. You need to put it over here. You, you're such an idiot. You're so stupid. Is it because I'm stupid or is it because I don't have that skill, that background, that learning, that technique? So it is not about intelligence. It's about our experience. It's about um, our uh, learn skills. It's not about intelligence. And it, I would say it's the same thing with if you've been taught to drive an automatic your entire life. You learn to drive in an automatic. You've always driven an automatic. And you go, this is how a car drives. And someone goes, would you like to take a, a drive in my brand new sports car? You go, oh, yeah, I'd like to drive that. You get in, it has a manual transmission, it has no sat-nav, there are no cup holders, and you go, what the hell is it? This is a crappy car. <laughs> and you go, this is a Maserati. And you go, so it's not a crappy car, but it's not meeting your expectations or what you have learned that a car should be or should do or should drive. And if you try to drive a manual transmission Maserati like you were driving your automatic Honda, it's not going to be a pleasant driving experience now, is it? Interesting analogy. No, but it makes sense. It checks out. Yeah. But you wouldn't say to that driver, you're stupid. Because it's, it's not about intelligence. It's about no one ever taught you how to drive a manual. And no one ever explained a manual to you. You thought, because of your experience and how you were taught, that an automatic was the only way to do it. So, I mean, that's why, again, I, I like it when... People share their experiences. People share their points of view. We all come at books very, very differently. Um, some of the uh, some of the people who I've received comments from, and I know that Ericsson's received comments from, are military veterans, and they comment on how battle is depicted or how the soldier's banter is depicted. And that is something I have no experience of. And I love seeing that feedback from people who know things that there's no possible way I could know them. And that's what I value about these discussions about literature. We all have backgrounds. We all have different ways of approaching it. And it's not that one is right and one is wrong, or one is smart and one is dumb. It's there are different ways, and we, we learn from each other. Oh, see, well, I just like to use this thing that I refer to as self-deprecating humor before someone else can do it. Uh, so <laughs> I think what I mean by uh, more intelligent me is that when I watch you, when I watch Philip, I feel like I'm learning stuff because <laughs> I don't feel like I'm ever going to know everything but I can learn some things and I'm never too old to learn new things. So uh, yeah, the self-deprecating humor is always just, you say it before some idiot can say it in the comments or sorry, someone less intelligent can say it in the comments and you feel like, Hey, all right, I beat you to the punch. It's not so funny now, is it? But um, we have, there's a saying in my family, every day is a school day and you never stop learning. Yeah. Uh, every day is an, is an opportunity to always learn more. And it's, it's I love, uh, when you talk about, say, the horror elements in, in the Malazan that you've seen, because I have a very limited understanding of the horror genre. It wasn't one that I spent a lot of time studying, and it wasn't one I spent a lot of time as a kid reading, um, because I find it scary, and I, I don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my brother showed me The Exorcist when I was six, so yeah, I was kind of, I was kind of in after that, so you know, I was um, born into this. So so seeing your take on the horror elements is always fascinating to me, because that's, that's an area I... I I sort of go, yeah, this is really creepy and weird. That, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> so back to Envy here. Am I supposed to? Am I supposed to trust her right away? Because I hear, you know, you got kind of a a complicated relationship in your past. I don't know how well that's going to work out and things like that. But these are the kind of things where I'm like, I want to know these things. And this is kind of the first instance I had where I said, okay, if some of the stuff happens in Esselmont or in Steve's prequel novel stuff, this is stuff I'm interested in knowing about. You know, so. That's the first time it's really kind of opened up me having an interest outside of these 10 books. So he's planting those seeds really early, and I'm very, very excited about that. Yeah, and of course, that's one of the things that's signaled in the prologue. Prologue of Gardens of the Moon, 
uh, you're on Mala's Island, you're in Mala City, the weather vane, prologue of Dead House Gates, you're in um, Unta, the capital of the Malazan world, uh, the Malazan Empire, and then the prologue here, you're suddenly in a much broader context, ancient history, the whole world, there are things that are beyond the bounds of the empire. And you see that reflected in the story, that it's no longer about the, the Malazan Empire, it's world-shaping events that are uh, coming to the fore. Because uh, it's the cripple, or uh, the, the poisoning of the, the Warrens, the, uh, the Panian Domen is being influenced by this evil god. It's getting uh, the Teast involved in this large-scale conflict. It's the Imas, it's Jagat. All of these things building up to go, it's not just about an empire anymore. Um, so you have that nice point of sort of thematic connection between the, the prologue and what actually happens in the book. But, okay, let, let's talk about Envy for a bit. Do you think that uh, talk missed out there? I think it was kind of a weird decision for him to leave uh, them, and he thought it was a safer decision to join the tennis gallery, but, you know... Uh, <laughs> well, it's this. Uh, I think this is one of those arguments that gets played around and around and around, and it's absolutely personal where you end up uh, end up on it. But personally, for me, number one, envy is frightening. She is frighteningly powerful. She has three Segula completely under her control. She's walking around with the first sword of the Talana Mass, mm. and you know these animals, and you're like, she's she's weird and powerful and scary and she takes one look at you going oh yeah i like you you're like uh -oh. this is not the meeting of equals you are food for her to play with before she eats you so that's that's the first thing the second thing is they've gone into a couple of fights and basically everyone has had to try and keep an eye out for talk because he's the only one who's going to catch an arrow in the side of the head and just be dead everyone else is a badass apart from him he's a normal human so envy is doing her own thing and she gets distracted and she loses her temper and she's she's a bit temperamental are you going to trust her to have your back in a fight no she she gets distracted and she wants her back so you can't trust her tool you can trust tool tool is a good guy undead thing we like tool you can trust him in a fight except if there's a whole army coming at you, is he going to be able to protect you the entire time? Can you trust these animals? Well, they're animals. How much trust can you have? Can you trust the three Segula? Well, they keep trying to take out Tull. How much trust is there there? <laughs> so when you look at the group you're traveling with, you go, well, there are some downsides here. Then you think, well, okay. Um, I've been having these weird voices in my head, one of which has said, I am sending you to this direction and influence like it th there's a, a passage in italics where tool receives information that is forcing him to join the tennis gallery and it's implied who this person is and they are an elder god so the implication is an elder god is influencing tool's decision so there's your second point your third point is tool is a trained infiltrator assassin scout he's he's a trained claw He's trained to infiltrate the enemy, walk through their ranks undetected. That's his training. So why wouldn't he feel confident about infiltrating the Tennis Gallery? Uh, because they're cannibals that rape dying people. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's a hard one for me to get past. I'm sticking with the ultra powerful wizard and the and the, and the, and, uh, the dude with the, that's awesome. With, all the people that are awesome with swords and taking apart a chain in like three seconds. You know, that's that's that's. <laughs> I yeah. don't know. But that's that's the thing you get and. Tool has all of these different things going on. And ultimately, he is still capable of making a bad decision. No one's saying that, oh yeah, Tool, sweet decision, my friend. I would have done exactly the same thing. You're awesome. Sometimes you look at it and go, how did you think that was ever going to work right. any other way? Right. But I will say also, besides Buke, I think Tool kind of gets about as good of a, ha a happy as an ending as, as a character can kind of get in this world. And I don't know if this is like the end of his arc, so to speak, because I know a lot of people said uh, Iskar has said that this is like the first arc of the story is books one through three. And he said he was probably kind of undecided with where, where arc two ends, but, uh, but definitely that 
I was thinking this tool is my favorite character in this universe so far. So if this is like the end of my um, run with tool, I'm, I'm going to be sad, but I think it's been very satisfying. But uh, given Hatton's previous behavior, you could be sure he's going to get a happy ending. But oh yeah, I okay. I, I say, who's <laughs> who? Hatton? Okay, yeah, yeah. I know who you are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but and again, it's Tool as a as a character, even the the Emas as as these different characters. Like we latch on to certain ones, but we have seen. Uh, it, all of the characters from, from book one, when we went into book two, the, it was a whole host of new characters, which by the end of book two, we went, you know what, I, I, I like some of these characters or I like a lot of these, you know, our experience varies. Then in book three, a bunch of new characters are introduced and you go, oh, well, okay, there's some new ones. And I actually, I really like this one and this one and this one. If this is going to be the repeatable experience of Malazan, that you're going to meet a whole bunch of different characters and they're all going to, a lot of them are going to be interesting and you're going to connect to them, then this is one of those things that uh, we, we constantly say we want in fantasy. You go, I want something different. I want it just repeating the same stuff over and over again. And you get a series like this and people go, well, it was very different every book. Yeah. You, well, you, you want it very different, but not very different. You, That that is a very fine line to walk, but uh, Tool is that's a wonderful arc for him to have, and we see the talk. Uh, although yeah, a lot of people described he just needed a hug, we see what hugs do in this in this book. Yeah, right. Um, but talk gets a, a new beginning as well, and you know that's there. It is. It might seem artificial, but the fact that some characters get rewarded. That uh, we have that sense of closure and completeness, and a, and a sense that you know a karmic balance that gets applied in in narrative fiction, that actually feels good sometimes. So it's nice. I like to see those elements. Whereas I think some people go, "Oh well, you know, he shouldn't have been. Why isn't he just killed off?" And you know, I I know that people have a problem with how death sort of happens in the Malazan world, but it's not like every major character comes back. Because if, if people have a problem with how death is handled in the Malazan world where there's a potential they might come back, I'd hate to see your reaction to Star Wars A New Hope when Obi-Wan dies. Because, you know, five minutes later, he's a voice in Luke's head. In the next film, he's a blue ghost who can sit down and talk to people. You know, oh, Obi-Wan's death is absolutely meaningless now that he can come back as a force ghost. Like, he can force sit my kids. He can go down to Starbucks and force a coffee. It's... The impact is in his death. The impact is in the loss that Luke feels. The impact is not necessarily what happens after that point. Like we can have that emotion then and there. And I think stuff with seeing Tool get rewarded or seeing Talk get rewarded, I, th I think that's the same thing. We, we like those feel-good moments as well as the tragic moments. They're so few and far between. You do appreciate them when you get them. Yes, for sure. <laughs> Like I said, but those like, dogs got healed. Yeah. <laughs> hey, who doesn't like dogs? I think what I told Philip was like, yeah, but uh, that's kind of like uh, Avengers Infinity War. You know, everyone dies, but hey, here's the Disney logo at the end. So not Grimdark, <laughs> you know. So <laughs> but no, I, I, I definitely I, I can agree with that. And, and I know my my opinion on the whole death thing has, uh, has really ruffled some feathers. Um, and, and the thing was, like I said, if that's what this series is about, I can accept that. I'm just saying it's I can definitely see myself being bothered more by how deaths affect other characters than when a character actually dies. Cause I'm sure I'll see him again in a couple books. <laughs> and you know what? That is absolutely fine. Like, it, one of the things that I, I love uh, about chatting to, to Erickson about his work is number one, if people don't enjoy it, he goes, well, okay, fine. Like he is absolutely accepting of, People not enjoying it. You have every right to have that opinion. Um, I think the only time I've ever seen Erickson get, and I, it wasn't even that he got angry, it's he got a little bit ticked, was when someone said that he couldn't write. And Well, that's just not true. <laughs> and you can understand why, you know, someone who's produced not only that 10 book series and has produced a collection of short stories and then done a series of novellas and uh, has done this thing and then also wrote those novels and, you know, is a professional author. 
you can be a little bit annoyed when someone says you can't write. Well, it's demonstrably false. I can. And that's, I think, the, the only thing that ever annoys Ericsson. Um, people sort of go, I didn't enjoy your book. He's like, yeah, okay. But, you know, reading's personal. We don't all have to enjoy the same thing. And having a different appreciation of what death means to you in a novel or the impact that that death is going to have or whether it's the impact it has on other people, that's how you, you feel it. That's, that's a personal interpretation of a text. And you go, that's what reading is all about. It's how we personally respond to literature. So I don't think anyone in their right mind would have a problem with your attitude or your response to deaths in, in the novel. It, that's what blew my mind about. I was like, I mean, I don't know how you can tell me I'm, I'm just not understanding. I was like, all I was saying is I'm not looking at death <laughs> the same way the rest of the way. That's all I've said. I never said that this makes no sense. I was just saying that's how I feel right now. But yeah, yeah. Well, you know, some people, it's uh, this is like their firstborn child and any kind of criticism they're not going to accept. But that's such a small minority. Most people have been, I talked with Escar about this. Most people have been absolutely amazing about this. I mean, they really have. They're uh, enjoying that I'm picking up things that they said they didn't catch their first time. They're enjoying when I miss things because they're like, ha, 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 I can't wait for this to happen, you know? So I'm happy to be that entertainment for people. Um, and I, I'm, I'm constantly impressed because obviously like with so many people watching you do this read, and I know you have a Discord and I know you interact with um, like the, the people on your Discord. I, I would find that so distract. That's not how I read it. I can't do it. I can't listen to audiobooks. Because oh, that's it. not how my brain works. Mm -hmm. And with novels, I need to sit and read a novel and finish it. And then I can go and talk to people because mm -hmm. I like to know how the, the novel actually fits together before I go and talk to it. And the idea of, of reading along with a whole lot of people where we'd be discussing each chapter is, to me, kind of one of the circles of hell. <laughs> um, but again, that would be my personal sort of approach to what reading is to me. And I can understand that other people go, no, but that's the best part because we, we talk about what we just read. We, we speculate about how it connects to other things. And that's really exciting. I just, I, oh. I think the whole point of it really is just to encourage people because I'm sure, you know, the tap out rate on this series is quite high of people will give up, you know? And so it really is just something there to keep each other honest, provide encouragement. Hey, you're not understanding this. Hey, I didn't understand it either, but you know what? I'm two chapters ahead of you and it makes sense. Trust me, just keep going, that kind of thing. It's more of an encouragement than it is. And of course you have your bounce and your goofy theories off each other, which with this series, I could tell you they're never right. Those theories are never right. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, like- Until they time, are. Yeah, well, like with Will of Time, I did like my wish list before each book. Here's what I want to see happen each book. With this series, I'm like, I don't even know if these characters are going to be in the next book. So I can't really do that with this. So that's why I decided to do the spoiler talks instead. And then like my favorite character kind of ranking from each book has been kind of the way I went with this. But the, the thing I would say to people is, listen, this is a fantasy series where, you know, you have people who can turn into dragons, where you have undead dinosaurs that have swords for arms, where, and all of it feels normal. That you don't go, those are undead dinosaurs with swords for arms. This is so dumb. You go, those are undead dinosaurs with swords for arms. And strangely, it fits with this world. Yeah. How is that possible? Completely fascinating. Yeah. It, like when Gruntle has like gets all of his squad and they all form together to form a giant tiger. <laughs> and you're like, what? It's like Voltron. Yeah, fancy Voltron is what I called it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I had the, you have this image of this giant tiger that's fighting away and then it gets hit and then this like little tiny person going, <laughs> and, and yet, wait, wait, and when you think of it in those terms, you go like, this is insane. And yet when you're reading it, you go, yeah, this makes sense. What kind of alchemy is this? That these weird, strange things make absolute perfect sense when you're seeing them on the page. Yeah, I think it'd be impossible for the series to ever have a jump the shark moment because it's just like these ideas are so grand and unique, like unique. I've never, ever read a series that just kind of goes for it, you know, like I know, but constantly. 
but the jump the shark moment was at the very beginning of Dead House Gates, where the giant shark sea monster thing gets a cusser to the face. Yeah. There you go. There's your jump the shark moment. Yeah, uh, a giant uh, <laughs> sea serpent that was communicating telepathically. <laughs> this is wild. Yeah. yeah. The, the way that they do. Uh, you know, is that not how giant sea serpents communicate in your part of the woods? Uh, well, what the series up to this point is, I feel like Memories of Ice is almost always in everyone's top three. And most people that are reading through the series for the first time, they say, this is the book that, that really sold them. I don't know, maybe I'm becoming like a Seven Cities guy, but I still think I like Dead House Gates the most at this point. Do you remember that far back, like how you felt up at this point? Um, for me, Gardens in the Moon was the book that sold me on the series because – uh, the first couple of times, I, I've told this story before, the first couple of times I read, tried to read Gardens of the Moon, I just wasn't in the right frame of mind and I was busy. And I didn't, I got maybe 50 pages in each time and kind of went, eh, I'll, I'll do this later. The third time I sat down and I read it end to end. I just relaxed. I went, this is something different. This is something new. This is something I want to spend time with. When I read Dead House Gates, the emotional journey that I went on in Dead House Gates was so incredibly powerful. And I know Dead House Gates can be very divisive, and I know there are certain characters in Dead House Gates that people like or don't like, and I'm not getting into that. Yeah, let's not touch that one. But <laughs> Dead House Gates, uh, for me, there were at least two storylines that had enormous emotional impact on me. And coming into this book then, that's a very high bar to be trying to clear as the next book in a series after the emotion that was attached to Dead House Gates. Mm. But this book is much more traditional in its structure. You are given an enemy and almost like the good guys, good the bad guys, guys. Bad guys yeah. mm -hmm. me and military stuff going on one section of uh, military sort of side quest with Parin and the Bargast and all of that really cool stuff. Another different sort of part of the world with Envy and Tull. But really, the main part of it is, here's this army, and we're on our way to fight this army. And so in terms of narrative, it's the closest, the Darkness at Sethanon by Raymond D. Feist is what it, it sort of reminded me of. Because a Magician is a tripartite interweaving of three different narratives. The uh, Politician, the Magician, and the Warrior. Three different narratives, welded to, uh, wended together, and then there's the break, and then they all come back together. That's Magician. Silverthorn was a quest. Darkness at Sethanon, the big epic, here's it all sort of concluding, and these, these forces coming together. Gardens of the Moon, lots of weird stuff happening, trying to get acclimatized to the world, different storylines, and seeing, not knowing who's good, who's bad, do we even have designations of good, bad? Dead House Gates, we have a lot of traveling and quest narratives, but it's an emotional journey. And then here we have the traditional conclusion. The, the third in a trilogy, the big epic battle. We had Capistan and Coral. We had two massive epic battles. But it felt the most traditional. So I can, I can understand why a lot of readers go, this is why I really like it. This really felt like an epic fantasy novel. Um, but for me, it's not that I dislike it, but it never, even with Itkovian, even with Whiskey Jack, it didn't reach the emotional resonance for me that Dead House Gates did. But those moments with uh, Itkovian's Barrow, the moments of saying goodbye to Whiskey Jack on Moonspawn and the two unnamed soldiers with him, mm. like those are incredibly powerful moments for me emotionally. Um, I'm not going into the reasons why, but they were very, very powerful moments. And there's a whole load of lore developed and uh, teased out in this book. And it broadens the scope of the rest of the world. I can see why people love this book so much. But of the first three, you know, the first one, captured my imagination because it was so different that it was uh, this different approach to prose and fantasy and structure and it was playing with these things and I went this is amazing and then Dead House Gates was so emotional that this one felt this is Erickson doing a traditional fantasy novel makes a lot of sense 
<laughs> uh, before I go, though, I, there is a non Malazan question I want to ask you. Now, we were talking about how things have aged differently as you get older, things you loved reading when you were younger, and you read it now. We brought up David Eddings. Now, I brought up Eddings. I have Belgariad, and I never read it. And I had said it was something I was going to read. People were like, you're not going to like it if you didn't read it when you were younger. So, my question to you, since you brought up Feist, is I have never read that trilogy, Feist, uh, what, Rift War. So if you're telling me I might not like Ed, or other people have told me I might not like Eddings at this age, do you think I would like Feist at this age and what I've read? Um, I'm, I'm trying to think of other books that you've really enjoyed because Feist is is not Frank Herbert. Um, if you okay, let's let's talk about both. If you looked at Eddings and went right, I'm going to read a young adult fantasy series. That's a quest narrative. Um, with characters with plot armor. That's that's what I'm going to go and read. You you might trip through Fry, uh, through Eddings, Belgariad, absolutely nicely. Uh, the Elenium is basically the same story, but it's a trilogy uh, with slightly different characters. Absolutely fine. You know, Eddings tells two stories. There's the Belgariad, which is followed by the Malorian. Don't bother reading the Malorian. It's just the Belgariad again. There's the, <laughs> uh, there's the Elenium, which is followed by the Tamuli. So it's two trilogies. Don't bother reading the Tamuli. It's just the Elenium again. Um, but he did do Troy, uh, which he obviously uh, co-wrote with his wife, and, and uh, she completed it after his death. Um, oh, sorry. I, I went into Gamel there, not Eddings. Gamel did the Troy, Troy stuff. Um, but Eddings, if you approach now as, as a young adult, um, I don't think you have the wrong expectations. There will be some bits of it that you'll go, this is a bit clunky. There'll be some bits of it you'll go, okay. Because it was written a different, in a different yeah. time, like nearly 40 years ago. So expecting modern sensibilities and treatment of sex and gender in it is, is not going to happen. Uh, but there are still some really cool things that happen in it. But I think you need to focus on it as YA. With Feist, um, my favorite Feist book was actually co-written by Johnny Wirtz, and it's Daughter of the Empire, the, uh, the second trilogy, um, Daughter of the Empire, Servant it's of the Empire. It's all the Rift War, right? It's all like yeah. huge series. Um, and it, it's part of the Rift War saga, but Johnny Wirtz was the, uh, the, the co-author of that stuff. And I really like that trilogy. Feist Magician was one of the key texts that I read as a young fantasy reader. And have you ever read R.A. Salvatore? Just his Star Wars stuff. So you didn't read any of the Forgotten Drag Realms stuff? Dragonland? No, no. A, a viewer actually sent me the first couple of books in that, but there's a friend that is actually the dungeon master in our D and D game has been really trying to push me on those. I'm like, let me finish Malazan, on you guys. And then I'll pick up new 45 book series, you know, <laughs> uh, I, I'll tell you about the, the forgotten realms books after we stop recording. Um, but in terms of Feist, I still think aspects of magician hold up to this day. Um, People have developed and run with it since then. But this is one of those texts, post-Tolkien, that is D&D-influenced, post-Tolkien, but is trying to do something different. And I think Feist Magician is still worth reading. Yes, there are still going to be elements in it where you're going to roll your eyes. But there are going to be elements in it where you're going to go, actually, that that's still kind of cool. And, I'm oh, I'm impressed with that. And it, it hasn't aged as badly as I think that David Eddings has. Yes. That, that, that was my concern. Just when people, that many people told me that. And they're like, don't waste your time on that. Read stuff like David Gimmel instead. And I'm like, I, 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 I'd still I, recommend Gimmel. I, 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 I started big... reading John Gwynn a lot. Like my top comments were always like, if you like this stuff, you've got to read David Gimmel. And so I've got, I've got Legend. I've had Legend for a while, but I got a bunch of other Drenai books on my Kindle. So once Malazan's done, the, the floodgates are just going to open for all these new series I can do because I won't. I feel like I got this one off my bucket list. I'm putting some Tad Williams on there next year, that one, and then Glenn, and Glenn Cook's Black Company. And that's all my fantasy bucket lists will be done. So, oh, the great. Glenn Cook's Black Company. Um, before I, it's one of these things. Before you read it, there's a novella called The Short Timers, which is what Full Metal Jacket is based on. Oh, nice. Okay. 
Uh, not not by Glenn Cook, but it, I can't remember who wrote it. But it's called The Short Timers. It is a very short uh, Vietnam War fiction. It's what Full Metal Jacket, the film, is based on. Read that. It'll only take you like, your lunch break. Okay. But if you read that before going into The Black Company, you suddenly go, this is, this is the Vietnam War in fantasy. In fantasy sounds life. awesome to me. Uh, which is, and it's very, very cool. I think people have been recommending Glenn Cook to me since I first started this channel and I was talking about uh, First Law. And everybody's like, you, you, you got to check out Glenn Cook. He's like the, the grandfather of Grimdark. You got to check that out. So I was one I had heard about in high school and I'd always put it on the list. Same with Tad Williams. And that's more because my brother's been hammer me to read Tad Williams since we were young kids. And when I called him in like the year 2000, I was like, Hey, have you ever heard of this song of ice and fire series? Like, ah, oh, that ain't nothing but a rap rip off of Tad Williams. Read Tad Williams. <laughs> okay. I just, you know, so he's been banging on me for 20 years now to, to read that. So uh, that's why that one's so high on the list. But uh, yeah, Glenn cook is the other one. It's got to happen at this point, but you know, I never thought I'd get to Malazan. I was like 2008, I think is when I first put this on my list to read. But, you know, all of these authors keep producing brilliant fantasy works. You know, don't they know that we, we, we already have loads that we're trying no, to we're read? never going to catch up. Stop. Go to the beach. No, don't stop. Don't ever stop. <laughs> don't, don't ever suggest to them to stop because the more, this is one of the things that I love. The more fantasy that gets produced, the, the better and bolder and broader and more diverse the, the genre gets. Like, think of the amazing stories that have yet to be written. And then the author's who have not yet become authors who are reading this stuff now and are getting inspired for the next generation of stuff like where fantasy can go from now in the future is it's it's open to the world and i want i want more i just want an ability to stop time so i can read all of the books in a single instant yeah see me right now i'm like i'm just, i've got more to read than i'll ever be able to finish before my time here is done but who knows Maybe I'll be an ascendant and I can read in that lifetime. But uh, I want to thank you for taking this uh, long out of your day to, to, to speak with me. I feel like we could probably talk for another hour at least. But, you know, my kids are banging on the door wanting some lunch. I probably better go ahead and end this. But anytime you want to talk about anything non Malazan related, because it sounds like we could definitely do that. Um, anything you want to talk about, uh, I, I am definitely down for it. Don't ever be afraid to reach out. I'd love to chat about anything you want to chat about. And um, tell people where they can find your channel in case they don't know. Well, firstly, Mike, let me say thank you so much for having having me on the channel. It has been absolutely brilliant. The second thing is, we should really have a chat about Man of Steel because I think we vehemently disagree on the appreciation uh, of Man of Steel as a movie. <laughs> oh, that's fine. I, like I said, I did a, a media podcast before this, and that was always one of those movies that I defended quite a bit as a big comic book fan, as a big Superman fan. So, uh, yeah, oh, it, I, it's, I I love talking about superhero movies and, and superhero adaptations. It's one of the things that I love analyzing and, and talking about. It's a lot of fun. So if you ever get bored and you want to talk superhero movies or sure, uh, the, sure. the superhero adaptation, sure. I am more than happy to sit down and talk superheroes. But thank I'm not a, a big comic book nerd. But thank you so much for, uh, for having me on the channel. It has been a brilliant chat. I'm really appreciating following along with your read-along, seeing your comments and videos on it. It's always nice to see people discussing the book, honestly, talking about the things that they like, the things that they don't like, and, and explaining why, because it gives us all a better insight into, into how all of this stuff functions. So thank you, Mike. I really appreciate it. I, anytime, anytime. And uh, yeah, knowing that uh, people like you and Philip and Iskar and, and even up to Mr. Erickson are actually watching this, I, I look forward to the feedback I get, even if it's in the form of, uh, you know, 3,000 word novellas from Mr. Erickson. I, I always look forward <laughs> To these reactions, because uh, to, to me, like I said, that's like going to a rock concert and then meeting the band afterwards. So I always look <laughs> forward to those uh, to those those comments. That's really, really awesome stuff. So uh, thank you. We'll have to get together again sometime in the back half of this. I've already got a guest for uh, four and five. But after that, I'm I'm open up and I'll probably I'm planning maybe just to, to rotate again. Iskar, you, Philip, and I because I, no one's ever going to be able to hit bigger questions that i want to answer than you guys will i don't think so uh, uh but you guys uh if you don't know he's doing the reread with philip they're doing it faster so if my every other month isn't fast enough for you they're doing one a month so they'll be done quite what, what book are y'all now are y'all on midnight tides right now we've finished midnight tides so we're moving on to uh, uh, Bone Hunters. Bone uh, Hunters? Okay. i can never remember which one's six 
Uh, bone hunters. Um, I, I always get I always get the two confused, but I, I'm fairly sure it's the bone hunters. But we're yeah, I also realized I had those books on my shelf in the wrong order for like this whole time now. So, Good times. well, they, they they're organized alphabetically by author name. Um, <laughs> you just go, oh, it's all just Erickson. Um, but we're also working in Esselmont's novels as well, the that's novels right. of the Malazan Empire. So uh, that that's interesting because obviously the the two uh, series interlink and and cross over, and there's plots developed in one that end up in the other one. And it's a lot of fun because it's a shared world. It's a, a fascinating narrative experience. There are people on the Discord that are doing the ultimate reading order and they're doing that where they're fitting them in chronologically and they're doing it on a first read. And I'm just like, you're insane. But <laughs> <laughs> they're enjoying it. They're enjoying it. But, uh, you know, what? whatever floats your boat, whatever way that people want to do it. It's, yeah. They are fantastic books. It's just a, it's such an amazing world. So. Yeah, it really is. And it sounds like it's just going to keep going. So that is exciting time. So uh, thank you again, and uh, we will get together soon. Okay. Thank you very much.